booktube you've been watching breathlessly on this channel while the second season of as steve read it unfolds this is an event that was originally created by matthew at mayberry book club where he just asked pick eight random books off your shelf and ask if i've read them with the implicit secondary question being if i have what do i think of them <laughs> and uh, a lot of people wanted to ask that question it's the closest we're ever going to come uh, to me roaming around your collection. Only a few people are lucky enough to have that happen in person. <laughs> uh, but the rest of you, this is as close as you're going to get. And that first season of Has Steve Read It had an arc, and it was lots of fun. And then there was a quiet period, and then Daniel at Guilty Feet revived it uh, for a second season. And this has been also lots and lots of fun. And I think also it is arcing towards a close. But not before providing me with lots and lots of great recommendations and fun discussion. And we have a few more contestants to go through in the hopes of maybe ending with a winner. Maybe we have a bunch of people at four beans. You get one bean for every book I haven't read. And we have a bunch of people at three. And we have a bunch of people at two. And we even have a large bunch of people unwanted by any civilized nation on earth sort of shunting from one ocean to the next who are down at one bean each we don't have anybody at zero beans we don't have anybody who's broken the halfway mark we, we we nobody at five beans and certainly nobody at eight so the last few contestants that all the spotlight is on them can they change that geometry and today we're doing cozy reading with quaker cats a fantastic booktube channel i will leave a link to her channel as you might be able to guess from the title <laughs> from the name of her channel she has lots of cats and I mean lots of cats. And they're saucy little things. They just wander all around. It's not like the kind of cat where when mommy sets up the camera, they disappear because they don't understand what's going on. Now, they wander all over the place. They're in every video. Um, but I love her channel anyway. <laughs> I love the way she talks about books. And she threw a hat in the ring. So we're going to go through her choices. And the first one is uh, Just Life by Neil Abramson. And despite the fact that it seems to be a novel about dogs, I haven't read it. It is a no, so she starts off the strongest way possible with one B. Uh, then we're going to move on to Will the Nurse Make Me Take My Underwear Off by Eric Mason, Joel Schwartz, Aiden McFarlane, and Anne McPherson. I would never have had the patience to type out all those names. But believe it or not, this is a yes. I, did, I, did, I had this urged on me by a customer uh, at my old bookstore who thought that it was life-changing, just thought that it was incredibly insightful, incredibly funny, incredibly whimsical, or, you know, off the wall. I didn't think it was any of those things. I didn't particularly like it, but uh, but it is a yes. I do remember it. I When I saw this uh, mentioned and talked about, I automatically wondered whatever became of the copy that I got, but I, it, it's long, long, 30 years gone. So, uh, so that's a yes. Uh, that balances things out. Then we go to number three, which is This Dog for Hire by Carol Lee Benjamin. Another book about dogs and another no. I feel like I'm letting the side down here, but I have, I have not read this one. Uh, so uh, that's a no. So that's two beans, uh, which means at least Cozy Reading with Quaker, Quaker Cats has staved off the fate of being in the one bean club. You don't really want that to happen to you in this or any other life. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Number four is What Looks Like Crazy on an Ordinary Day by, per by Pearl Cleage. And I, this is a yes. Uh, there was a time when I was working in, in bookstores, when uh, I would get customers would come in, it was sort of sort of like the real world, normal, non-crazy, non-fascistic version of my representation. I would have customers come in and say, do you have, you know, aside from, aside from canonical classics, do you have any modern fiction written by black people, starring black people, concerned with, the, with black life in America, that sort of thing? In other words, the legitimate version of my representation, where you just want to you want it, they did want it to be good, uh, but you're not you're not willing to pile everything that doesn't have that into into heaps outside the city hall and burn it in front of your children, telling them this is how you should do it as well. You weren't willing to do any of the 21st century excesses, and I I went looking for authors like that to stock my fiction section. I went looking for what we would now in the 21st century call uh, diversity. Uh, and, you know, back in, in 20 years ago or 30 years ago or whatever, there were lots and lots of moments where I looked at that contemporary fiction wall. At the time, we had it separate from the rest of fiction. There were times when I would look at that wall and think, boy, there isn't a lot of diversity here. You know, I had no idea about the new, the new millennium that was coming. But one way or another, this is a yes. I not only ordered it in for the store, uh, but I also read everything that we got so that I could, you know, assess the the quality so because it you know the quality varies in all fiction so i would get great stuff 
like Mama Day uh, by Gloria Naylor. I know that's, that's a little bit of a, uh, an iffy book with her. Not everybody loves it. But I thought it was. I thought it was terrific. We also got uh, the first few, the first three novels by Tara McMillan I could not keep in the store. And uh, I read them and found out why. I found out how good they were. I'm not 100% sure if that has stayed true. Are there any of you, I mean, all of you will be fans of Terry McMillan's first three novels, I'm sure. But have any of you stuck with her? I let go of her, of reading her every time she had a new book for a long time and then went back, I think, four years ago and read her new book. And it was rather noticeably weak. And I'm wondering if that was just a bad book or if, if she has maybe started phoning it in or I, I don't know one way or another. But unfortunately, uh, what looks like crazy on an ordinary day is a yes. Uh, then we go on to number five, uh, which is Seven Cats and the Art of Living by Joe Kudert. Uh, uh, <clears throat> on season two of Has Steve Read It, we've had several categories for kinds of books, right? The most common category has been the face palm. And that is where you, I look at a book on someone's list and simply cannot imagine what they were thinking when they put it on a list of books they thought I maybe hadn't read. <laughs> I think for season two, the all-time winner of that will be the Mabinogion. That will be the, the, the canonical literary epic of Wales. Still a little bit gobsmacked by that, but, but that, that is one category uh, of, of facepalm. And then there's a, a quantum face palm, and that's where uh, there's written documentary evidence that that I know this book particularly, not just this author, but this book particularly. There's been one of those, and then there's the face palm singularity, where you hold up a book and say, "Who wonder if Steve's read this?" And my name is on the back of the book in a blurb. That hasn't happened yet. I trust that it never will. I trust that at the very least. The rest of you are checking the backs of your books before you before you put them into the spotlight. That hasn't happened. We have a whole bunch of those categories, uh, but this video introduces a new category, and that is a no that is also a good god no, <laughs> because of course I have not read Seven Cats and the Art of Living. I had to look it up on Amazon, and when I did, a cold chill ran up my spine. <laughs> it's about living like a crazy cat person. It's about living with huge numbers of cats. Frida and I are already having gigantic amounts. Of, like We're talking Treaty of Versailles amounts of tension with the two cats who live here. We don't want any more. <laughs> there was an incident. Sooner or later, in one of our rambling live streams, Mark and I will talk about the incident. There was an apocalyptic incident. <laughs> We're lucky that any of us survived. <laughs> but, but no, not only have I not read Seven Cats and the Art of Living, not only is that a no, it's a good God no. <laughs> uh, so we'll move on. So, so but no, a good God no still counts as a no. So we are three beans. Uh, the next book is number six, Things My Son Needs to Know About the World by Frederick Backman. Uh, and this is a no. I have read a couple of this guy's novels. They are decidedly hit or miss. I've read uh, one that was really, really good and two that were really, really bad with no middle ground. Uh, so I, what would he be able to put in a book of advice for his son? If you're going to be an author, make sure your supply of Adderall is steady. I have, I have no idea what he would be able to tell his son. But it's this, this type of book doesn't really do it for me. This, this Whether it's Ta-Nehisi Coates doing this, or whether it's uh, Frederick Bachman doing this, that that those kind of slim, oh my little boy, you're just an infant in my hands. Let me tell you about the world that's approaching you. It always strikes me as just 100% about how cool the adult parent author is. That just that's just gross, absolutely gross. Uh, like like for instance, thinking back to my days working in a bookstore, one time I was visiting the kids person up on the second floor just to poke fun at her. I wandered around the store all day just visiting people, poking fun at people. I had many, many managers stop in the middle of their day, stop in the middle of doing something really hard, reworking a display, doing paperwork or whatnot. They would just be walking across the floor, the sales floor, and they would stop and say, what do you do around here? <laughs> that was always bad. Those moments were always bad. <laughs> Especially when it was a new manager because then they wouldn't ask it with humor. They'd ask it with a little bit of pointedness. They'd say, what, what? What are you supposed to be doing right now? And at one time, one time only, a very old manager who had been working with me forever and ever heard a younger manager, a, a subordinate manager say that. And he just off, wasn't being aggressive or passive aggressive in any way. He just offhandedly says, I told this, this new manager, 
when the lunch rush happens at 10 past noon, you'll see what he does here the rest of the time. He can just wander around. We're not sure we want his help. There's a little of going around here in the old house in Vermont. All sorts of practical chores for which my help is not exactly what. <laughs> I only have a couple of skills. <laughs> anyway, uh, I was visiting with the kids person one day. And it was in the middle of the day, the popular time for nannies and parents to bring their kids into the to the children's section, had to do a read along. I used to do read alongs when I was up there because I was drafted because I was conspicuously idle. Uh, and one guy, oh, my blood boils even today. He had the ponytail, even though he was ten years too old for it. He had the the hipster clothing, even though he was ten years too old for it. He was just some sort of computer geek. Thought he was the coolest person in the world. He brought his kid, this little blump of protoplasm that had the singular lack of fortune to be his kid, brought him to the entrance to the children's section, waited a second until he was sure that all the other nannies and parents knew that he was entering the children's section, and then said out loud, all right, kid, here's the children's section. Make sure not to learn anything. Just And then paused for a fraction of a second because he knew, oh, this is so clever. Paused for applause. I said to the children's person, our children's manager, I whispered to her, Isn't, are there some times when you just want to put a bullet through the head of the adults who come in here? And she said, you just described my job. <laughs> but anyway, why was I on that subject? Uh, oh, yes, the, 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 the instruction manual is the kid. Strike me as a lot like that ponytailed kid, that guy that I just... I'm hoping that his child reached the age of eight and immediately sued for emancipation. <laughs> I don't know. I'll never know. Uh, I'll never set foot back in another children's section. Certainly not as a wandering employee at large. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's a no. I, wild horses couldn't get me to read a thing like this. If the only circumstance I can think of where I would read one of these totally solipsistic, oh, my son, here's what I've learned about life. And the only conceivable circumstance in which I would read something like that is if one of those books, like Ta-Nehisi Coates, were written by a major literary figure, in which I guess I would have to read it, but I, <laughs> I would roast it over a slow fire. <laughs> so we'll move on uh, to number seven, The Revolution of Marina M. by Janet Fitch. This is a yes. This is not quite a face palm, but, it, I mean, this was a major contemporary historical fiction release in the year of its release. I certainly got an advanced copy. I may even have written about it. Uh, so it's a yes. It's pretty, it's pretty clearly in yes territory. Uh, and then the final entry, Drawing in the Dust by Zoe Klein. And this is also a yes. Uh, and if you've been keeping track at home through the blizzard of digressions, <laughs> you have seen that that means we have added yet another person to the highest possible category, four beans. So we, we had one winner, Hannah at Hannah's Books, her brilliant son, not only did a, an original Star Trek composition on his banjo, I might point out again here, no, no rush or anything, that uh, he is obliged to make a banjo composition for me of the real Star Trek's theme song. He hasn't done it yet, but that's okay. He will. I'm sure he's very busy being brilliant. Uh, but he got... Uh, uh, four beans, and then he was joined by Sean Stanfast, and now there's, and, and, uh, didn't we have a four beans yesterday? I think we did. I think James Holder, yeah, got four beans and almost got five beans. So, and now, there, now there's another four beans. So, the top rung, uh, is not very high. It's 50%, but it's still, it's got one extra inhabitant now, and a new category. A good god, no. <laughs> so, so there you go. That is Cozy Reading with Quaker Cats. I will leave uh, her channel down below so that you can check it out. Uh, and we've got a couple more of these to do uh, for season two of Has Steve Read It? So uh, we'll get on them. <laughs> we'll see. We're, we're running out of opportunities for anybody to get either zero beans or higher than four beans for this season. And then who knows? Some booktuber as yet unborn will, will years from now, make a season three. <laughs> but in the Oh, well, no. Actually, that isn't going to happen because we'll all have been booted off you booktube by then. Maybe it'll be something else. Some other platform. I like SteveTube. That's like a good ring to it. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to wrap this up, but I'll be back. Thank you, booktube.